Chapter Six, Part Two of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Three, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirty-four, thirty-five. They said therefore unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said unto them, Hereby is clearly divulged, though much desiring to be hid the aim of the jews and that one might see that it is not lawful for the truth to lie which said that not because they saw the miracles were they therefore eager to follow him but because they did eat of the loaves and were filled with reason then were they condemned for their much dullness and i suppose one should truly say to them lo a foolish people and without heart they have eyes and see not they have ears and hear not for while our saviour christ by many words as one may see is drawing them away from carnal imaginations and by his all-wise teaching winging them unto spiritual contemplation they attain not above the profit of the flesh and hearing of the bread which giveth life unto the world they still picture to themselves that of the earth having their belly for god as it is written and overcome by the evils of the belly that they may justly hear whose glory is in their shame and you will find such language very consonant to that of the woman of samaria for when our saviour christ was expending upon her too a long discourse and telling her of the spiritual waters and saying clearly whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that i shall give him shall never thirst but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life she caught at it through the dullness that was in her and letting go the spiritual fountain and thinking nothing at all about it but sinking down to the gift of sensible wells says lord give me this water that i thirst not neither come hither to draw akin therefore to her language is that of the jews for as she was weakly by nature in the same way i think have these two not male or manly in their understanding but are effeminated unto the unmanly lust of the belly and show that that is true of them which is written for the foolish man will utter folly and his heart will imagine vain things i am the bread of life it is the custom of our saviour christ when explaining the more divine and already foretold mysteries to make his discourse upon them darksome and not too transparent for he commits not his so dread word to lie unveiled before the unholy and profane indiscriminately at their pleasure to be trodden down by them but having veiled it in the armour of obscurity he renders it not invisible to the prudent but when he seeth among his hearers any foolish ones and who understand no whit of the things spoken he opens clearly what he wills to make known and removing as it were all mist from his discourse he sets the knowledge of the mystery before them bare and in full view hereby rendering their unbelief without defence that it was his wont as we have said to use an obscure and reserved method of speaking he will himself teach us saying in the book of psalms i will open my mouth in parables and the blessed prophet isaiah too no less will confirm our explanation hereof and show it in no wise mistaken proclaiming behold a righteous king shall reign and princes shall rule with judgment and a man shall veil his words for he says that he has reigned a righteous king over us who saith yet was i appointed king by him upon zion his holy mountain declaring the commandment of the lord and princes living together in judgment that is in uprightness in everything he calls the holy disciples who came to the saviour christ oftentimes veiling his words saying 
declare unto us the parable and he once on hearing the question why speakest thou unto the multitudes in parables is found to have declared most manifestly the cause because they seeing he says see not and hearing they hear not nor understand for they were no ways worthy it seems seeing that god who judges justly decreed the sentence upon them the saviour then having devised many turns in his discourse when he saw that his hearers understood nothing at length says more openly i am the bread of life and well nigh makes an attack upon their unmeasured want of reason saying o ye who have the mastery over all in your incomparable uninstructedness alone when god declares that he will give you bread from heaven and has made you so great a promise in feeding you with manna do ye limit the divine liberality and are not ashamed of staying the grace from above at this not knowing that it is but a little thing both for you to receive such things of god and for god himself to give them you do not then believe saith he that that bread is the bread from heaven for i am the bread of life who of old was foreannounced to you as in promise and shown as in type but now am present fulfilling my due promise i am the bread of life not bodily bread which cutteth off the suffering from hunger only and freeth the flesh from the destruction therefrom but remoulding wholly the whole living being to eternal life and rendering man who was formed to be for ever superior to death by these words he points to the life and grace through his holy flesh through which this property of the only begotten that is to say life is introduced into us but we must know for i think we ought with zealous love of learning to pursue what brings us profit that for forty whole years was the typical manna supplied to them of israel by god while moses was yet with them but when he had attained the common termination of life and jesus was now appointed the commander and general of the jewish ranks he brought them over jordan as it is written and having circumcised them with knives of stone and brought them into the land of promise he at length arranged that they should be fed with bread the all-wise god having now stayed his gift of manna thus for the type shall now be transferred to the truer when moses was shrouded that is when the types of the worship after the law were brought to naught and christ appeared to us the true jesus for he saved his people from their sins then we crossed the jordan then received the spiritual circumcision through the teaching of the twelve stones that is of the holy disciples of whom it is written in the prophets that the holy stones are rolled upon his land for the holy stones going about and running over the whole earth are of a surety these through whom also we were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in spirit that is to say through faith when then we were called to the kingdom of heaven by christ for this and not else i deem it pointeth to that some entered into the land of promise then the typical manna no longer belongeth to us for not by the letter of moses are we any longer nourished but the bread from heaven that is to say christ nourishing us unto eternal life both through the supply of the holy ghost and the participation of his own flesh which infuseth into us the participation of god and effaces the deadness that cometh from the ancient curse he that cometh to me shall not hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst there is herein again something concealed which we must say for it is the want of the saviour christ not to contend with the praises of the saints 
but on the contrary to crown them with glorious honours but when certain of the more ignorant folk not perceiving how great his excellence over them offer them a superior glory then does he to their great profit bring them to a meter idea while they consider who the only begotten is and that he will full surely surpass by incomparable excellencies but not over clear does he make his discourse to this effect but somewhat obscure and free from any boast and yet by consideration of or comparison of the works it forcibly takes hold on the vote of superiority for instance he was discoursing one time with the woman of samaria to whom he promised to give living water and the woman understanding not of the things spoken said art thou greater than our father jacob who gave us the well but when the saviour wished to persuade her that he was both greater than he and in no slight degree more worthy of belief he proceeds to the difference between the water and says whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that i shall give him it shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life and what thence does he give to understand but surely this that the giver of more excellent gifts must needs be surely himself more excellent than he with whom was the comparison some such method then of leading and instruction he uses now too for since the jews were behaving haughtily towards him and durst think big putting forward on all occasions their lawgiver moses and often asserting that they ought to follow his ordinances rather than christ thinking that the supply of manna and the gushing forth of water from the rock were most reasonable proof of his superiority over all and over our saviour jesus christ himself needs he did return to his wonted plan and does not say downright that he is superior to moses by reason of the unbridled daring of his hearers and their being most exceeding prone to wrath but he comes to this very thing that is marvelled at and by comparison of it with the greater proves that it is small for he that cometh to me he says shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst yea saith he i too will agree with you that the man it was given through moses but they that did eat thereof hungered i will grant that out of the womb of the rocks was given forth unto you water but they who drank thirsted and the aforesaid gift wrought them some little temporary enjoyment but he that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst what then doth christ promise nothing corruptible but rather that blessing in the participation of his holy flesh and blood which restoreth man wholly to incorruption so that he should need none of the things which drive off the death of the flesh food i mean and drink it seems that he here calls water the sanctification through the spirit or the divine and holy ghost himself often so named by the divine scriptures the holy body of christ then giveth life to those in whom it is and holdeth them together unto incorruption being commingled with our bodies for it is conceived of as the body of none other but of him which is by nature life having in itself the whole virtue of the united word and in quality yea or rather fulfilled with his effectuating might through which all things are quickened and retained in being but since these things are so let them who have now been baptized and have tasted the divine grace know that if they go sluggishly or hardly at all into the churches and for a long time keep away from the eucharistic gift through christ and feign a pernicious reverence 
in that they will not partake of him sacramentally they exclude themselves from eternal life in that they decline to be quickened and this their refusal albeit seeming haply to be the fruit of reverence is turned into a snare and an offence for rather ought they urgently to gather up their implanted power and purpose that so they may be resolute in clearing away sin and essay to live a life most comely and so hasten with all boldness to the participation of life but since satan is manifold in his wiles he never suffers them to think that they ought to be sober-minded but after having denied them with evils persuades them to shrink from the very grace whereby it were likely that they recovering from the pleasure that leads to vice as from wine and drunkenness should see and consider what is for their good breaking off therefore his bond and shaking off the yoke cast upon us from his tyranny let us serve the lord with fear as it is written and through temperance show ourselves superior to the pleasures of the flesh and approach to that divine and heavenly grace and mount up under the holy participation of christ for thus thus shall we overcome the deceit of the devil and having become partakers of the divine nature shall mount up to life and incorruption thirty six but i said unto you that ye have both seen me and believe not by many words doth he struggle with them and in every way urge them to salvation by faith but he was not ignorant as god that they would run off to unbelief as their sister or intimate foster sister and would regard as not him who called them to life in order then that they might know that jesus was not ignorant what manner of men they would be found or rather to speak more fittingly that they might learn that they were under the divine wrath he charges them again but i said unto you that ye have both seen me and believe not i foreknew says he and clearly foretold that ye would surely remain hard and keeping fast hold of your cherished disobedience ye would be left without share in my gifts and when did christ say anything of this kind remember him saying to the blessed prophet isaiah go and tell this people hear ye in hearing and understand not and looking look and see not for the heart of this people is waxen fat will not the word be shown to be true by these things also which are before us for they saw they saw that the lord was by nature god when he fed a multitude exceeding number which came unto him with five barley loaves and two small fishes which he break up but they have seen and believe not by reason of the blindness which like a mist hath come upon their understandings from the divine wrath for they were i suppose without doubt worthy to undergo this for that they caught in innumerable stumblings and fast holden by the indissoluble bands of their transgressions received not when he came him who had power to loose them for this cause was the heart of this people made fat but that the multitude of the jews saw by the greatness of the sign that jesus was by nature god you will understand full well by this too for marvelling at what was done as the evangelist says above they sought to seize him and to make him a king no excuse then for their folly is left unto the jews for astounded and with much reason at the divine signs and coming from the works proportionably to the might of him who worketh they well nigh shudder at their readiness to believe and spring back from good habits readily making a somersault as it were into the very depths of perdition thirty seven all that the father giveth me shall come to me 
it did not behove the lord simply to say ye have both seen me and believe not but it was necessary that he should bring in besides the reason of their blindness that they might learn that they had fallen under the divine displeasure therefore as a skilful physician he both shows them their weakness and reveals the cause of it not in order that they on learning it may remain quiet in it but that they may by every means appease the lord of all who is grieved at them that is to say for just causes for he would never be grieved unjustly nor would he who knows how to give righteous judgment have given any such judgment upon them were not reason calling him thereto from all sides hasting unto the duty of accusal the saviour hereby affirmed that everything should come to him which god the father gave him not as though he were unable to bring believers to himself for this he would have accomplished very easily if he had so willed according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself as paul saith but since it seemed somehow necessary and more fit to say that they who were in ignorance were illumined by the divine nature he again as man attributes to the father the operation as to things more god befitting for so was his wont to do as we have often said but it is probable that when he says that all that he giveth him shall be brought to him by god the father he points to the people of the gentiles now about full soon to believe on him it is the word of one skilfully threatening that both they shall fall away from grace and that in their stead shall come in all who of the gentiles are brought by the goodness of god the father to the son as to him who is by nature saviour and life-giving that they partaking of the blessing from him may be made partakers of the divine nature and be thus brought back to incorruption and life and be reformed under the pristine fashion of our nature as though one should bring a sick man to a physician that he might drive away the sickness that has fallen upon him so we say that god the father brings to the son those who are worthy salvation from him bitter then and full of destruction is hardness of heart to them that have it therefore doth the word of prophecy chide the jews crying aloud be ye circumcised to god and circumcise the hardness of your heart ye men of judah and inhabitants of jerusalem yet not for them but for us rather hath god the father kept the circumcision in the heart namely that which is through the holy ghost wrought according to the rites of him who is a jew inwardly it is then right to flee from their disobedience and with all zeal to renounce hardness of heart and to reform unto a more toward disposition if we would avert the wrath that was upon them unto destruction and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out he says that conversion through faith will not be profitless unto them that come to him for he had to show that the being brought by god the father was a most desirable thing and productive of ten thousand goods things most excellent then saith he shall be theirs who through the grace from above are called to me and come for i will not cast out him that cometh that is i will not discard him as an unprofitable vessel as is said through one of the prophets jeconias was despised as a vessel whereof there is no use he was cast away and cast forth into a land which he knew not earth earth hear the word of the lord write ye this man a man proscribed he shall not then be proscribed saith he nor cast out as one despised nor shall he abide without share of mine regard but shall be gathered up into my garner and shall dwell in the heavenly mansions and shall see himself possessed of every hope 
beyond understanding of man for eye hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god prepared for them that love him it is probable that the word i will not cast out him that cometh to me signify moreover that the believer and he that cometh to the divine grace shall not be delivered over to the judgment for you will find that the word out has some such meaning as in that parable in the blessed matthew for saith he the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which having brought up and dragged to the shore they gathered the good into vessels but cast the bad away for that the good are gathered into the divine and heavenly courts we shall understand by his saying that the good were gathered into vessels and by the unprofitable being cast away we shall see that the ungodly shall fall away from all good and go away into judgment when then christ says him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out let us understand that the people which cometh unto him through faith shall never fall into torment most wisely does he seem to me in these words to veil a threat against those most abandoned men that if any will not turn with all speed to obedience they shall be deprived of all good and be excluded even against their will from his friendship for wherein he promises not to cast out him that cometh he in the same signifieth that he will surely cast out him that cometh not end of chapter six end of commentary on the gospel of john book three by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey